Welcome to episode six of Gas and Digital Great Ideas. I'm your host, Chris Goodson. Today, we're talking about student assignments and how we create and organize them in a time of hybrid, remote, and face-to-face learning. Hope you enjoy the show. All right, so I'm here with Andrea Naren. Uh, tell us a little about yourself. Um, so I teach science, biology, and forensics at Ashbrook High School, and I've been to Greenway okay. since 2007. But um, this is year 28 teaching in North Carolina public schools. Wow. Okay. All right. So uh, I've talked to a number of teachers so far uh, about, you know, what it's like to use technology well in the classroom in in this crazy situation we're in. And just to make sure you are, you are not all remote, correct? You are hybrid. Correct. I am hybrid. So Monday, Tuesday, A students, Wednesday remote, and Thursday, Friday, B students. Okay, great. So, so... Tell me a little bit. I've been thinking a lot about assignments lately. How how has this affected the way you give assignments, especially thinking about how we use Canvas? What have been some of the, the good things and bad things about that? What have you learned so far this year about assignments and in, in this time? Um, well, I think for me, you have to really, really concentrate and process a lot of what is the best use of those two 90 minutes that I have with them face to face. Yes. And so in a science classroom, lab work is so vital. And they may or may not have materials at home to do lab work. So we've spent a lot of class time, um, particularly in forensics, to do a lot of lab work and then other things that I have to that they can do at home. Um, It's it's just a lot of processing. Normally you would just, okay, we'll go over this information and Mm -hmm. we'll do this assignment um, on what used to be Google Classroom. And then we'll do the lab and then we'll do this. But I have to try to make sure that I schedule it so that the lab days fall on the face to face time and the other assignments that they can do on their own research type assignments, like looking up different poisons that falls on a remote day, because that's something they can really do at home with the Internet that they don't have to have me to help to talk them through the lab. So gotcha. So and and that's something that I've heard a lot of uh, other teachers echo. It's that idea that, you know, with limited time, you really can't you can't just leave those days that that Monday and Tuesday or or Thursday and Friday. There's two days. You can't just have that as like a regular class day like we used to. You've got to you got to pick out the parts where they need you there to help assist them and scaffold them and, and really hit that hard there. So um, how, how did that work with Canvas? I mean, how did the students react at first to having those having all those assignments that they were maybe doing more in class before now be things that are in Canvas on their own? Um, well, the way I've scheduled mine, I, each module is a week. OK. And the week's date, it tells them what the topic is. It says like week one topic is DNA analysis for the A kids starts this day. And do this day. B kids starts this day. And I know that's a lot of information, but that helps them find where where they're supposed to be in that particular week on that particular day. Inside the module, I have coded anything that says D1, we do on the first day I see you. Anything that says D2, we do on the second day I see you. And then I have R1 for remote day one, R2 for remote day two, and R3 for remote day three. Okay. So it, just, if it's okay with you, I'm going to stop you for a second. I'm going to pull, I've got, I've actually got your class up on the other screen. So I'm going to pull that up if it's okay with you so everybody can see exactly what you're talking about. Because I think that's a really organizational thing because it kind of goes back to Harry Wong and, and building your, you know, your class routines and your class procedures. And that is a procedure. So, you know, if, if you just looked at this, you'd be like, what does this mean? But you've taught your kids what D1, D2, R1, R2 means. Correct. And so, yeah, I've got it up here on the screen now. So a kid looking at this week in a glance knows exactly what they're supposed to do on each day at the beginning of the week. Right. Correct. Um, and it, it goes the module goes live Sunday at 4 p.m. Mm-hmm. So the B kids could actually work ahead um, if they wanted to, if they were already ahead, they could work ahead. But the, the A kids will get it Sunday night at 4 p.m. And I post everything on Canvas, even if there are assignments they are doing with me, because, you know, we have I have had some kids on quarantine that, you know, are not able to come and or some kids that, you know, there are always kids that miss the bus or what, for whatever reason they're absent. They can still go to Canvas and see what it was we did in class today so that they don't get behind and don't have to wait, you know, for the next week to say, OK, Miss Aaron, I missed Tuesday. What did we do? They can go on Canvas and they can see what we did. 
I think that's really important. And in fact, that's the sort of thing students were telling me back before COVID when we were, we were on Google Classroom. And I would ask students, hey, what do, you, what do you think about Google Classroom? Is it working? They're like, it's good. It's good. I was like, well, what do you want your, your, your teachers to do? And that was something I heard every time was they said, I want them to put everything in it uh, and whatever the LMS is, because once they're used to that, they they are used to looking at that to see what's going on and what they've got. Is it, and and if if you put some things in there and other things don't, it it's gets them confused. Correct. So I, I feel like that's been really helpful. And and my students have given me feedback, and they have said, you know, Miss Aaron, I always know what I'm supposed to be doing um, on my campus in your class because of the coding system that I have established from the very beginning. Um, and so, yeah, they, I feel like they understand what to do. They know what to do when, um, they know when it's due. Mm -hmm. so they, and if they have to do their assignments on Saturday or Sunday, because they had to work on Friday, they know when everything's due and they know it's all due Monday at 8am or Thursday at 8am if they're A or B cohort. So, mm -hmm. and, and another thing, and I'm going to pull it back up uh, just cause I wanted to, to show this to everybody. Um, another thing I've noticed you've done is that. Um, you just have one assignment for both cohorts, but you'll notice it says multiple due dates. So that means you've got it set uh, at the bottom where you you can add it to different sections uh, and give each section a different due date. So I'll, I'll make sure I've got in, um, links to a video or instructions on how to do that in case people aren't, aren't familiar with that yet. So, right. yeah, so that's you, great. You basically have to assign the kids into a cohort. Mm hmm and create a section and then um, then it's due on this day. And the way I have my notifications set up is that Canvas lets me know if a student does it late. Ah, so, OK. So if the, if I set the due date for Monday, 8 a.m. and they turn it in at 845, mm -hmm. then Canvas will send me an email that says Chris Goodson has completed this assignment late. Um, so that that's helpful for me as well. So I know that to make sure I go back to assignment if the student has completed it late. Excellent. So along those lines, something I've been thinking about, I've been talking to a few teachers about this. Um, how how are you handling late work in, in Canvas? So so in other words, I, I know some teachers have asked me, hey, you know, I put a due date on it, but I don't want them to be able to, to go back, you know, six weeks and, and turn in old late there. So have you been setting sort of a cap with the available from and available until or? Well, for the first nine weeks, honestly, I did not count assignments yeah. just because I feel like Canvas was such a huge learning curve for them and for Absolutely. me. But what I have done now is I have actually gone in to my Canvas and unpublished hmm. weeks one through seven. Okay. And I, but I did move all of the notes into a separate module. It says week one through seven notes. And I'm oh, okay. there. So if the kids needed to go back and look at notes for reference, mm -hmm. they still have access to the notes, but they don't have access to the assignments for the assignments for that week. Yes, yeah, so that I've, makes a lot of sense. I've unpublished them so that they can't just go back and start randomly doing assignments and then say, Miss Aaron, why didn't you grade my project? It's because it was week one. And mm -hmm. you know, the, that nine weeks is closed, grades are submitted, report cards are printed. Yep. Done. So and that, that makes a lot of sense. I like that idea of having those resources there for them. So notes, you know, um, PowerPoints or slideshows, or, you know, even if you did videos, things like that, having that available for them to go back, that's a huge resource. And, and you're absolutely right there. You don't want them to be locked out of that. You want them to be able to keep going back to that if they need to. I right. like that idea of putting, pulling all those into a separate module so they can see that module. That's neat. And it, it's easy to do because all you have to do is go to that assignment and click copy to mm -hmm. module of weeks one through seven no exactly and just copy it to that module and it, it canvas really puts it in there for you yep. you copy to that module copy to that module you just kind of scroll through and copy them and it automatically puts them in there so and that's one of those things i, I can tell by looking at your class that your students work in the module section a lot um and and a lot of teachers are doing it that way some teachers also are doing it more home page heavy where they have their home page and then links to everything from there that would work in that case too because that module for for previous notes you could even put a button that links to that module uh on your home page as well so a lot of a lot of different ways to make that work that's a great idea yeah so so the minor, yeah. minor totally get their assignments and modules and i've hidden everything else yes because you know i don't want them to get confused based that's, on some some feedback i've gotten from parents of you know in this teacher's canvas 
you have to go here to find it. And this teacher's canvas, you have to go here to find it. And I don't want them to get confused. So I've hidden everything except um, homepage, announcements, syllabus, and modules. That's it. That's, so really that's what they can do is click on module and find my assignment so they don't get confused. And that's, that makes a lot of sense. I've been hearing a lot of teachers say the same thing where they're, they're hiding as much as possible. Sometimes having too many choices is, is what leads to that kind of overload and shutdown on the part of students. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, uh, we're almost out of time. I've got, I've got two quick questions for you. Okay. Point number one, uh, one piece of advice to teachers uh, from what you've learned this year. Okay. Um, I feel like you need to do some research to find some good electronic assignments. Um, they, like, for example, quiz is mm -hmm. basically multiple choice practice questions, but it feels like a video game because if you have the power ups on and whatnot. Yeah. And I have mindset because I usually give those for practice for tests. And if you find those types of assignments, the kids don't feel like they're doing worksheet, 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 worksheet. They feel yeah. like they're playing a video game, even though they're doing practice questions or ed right. they, they feel like they're watching videos instead mm -hmm. of, you know, lecture notes, even though it sometimes is similar to what they would get in a lecture note. So I feel like that's the first thing is to try to find some electronic assignments. But but I will also say this, the first two days of class, week one, we modeled every in biology, we modeled every type of thing we wanted them to be able to do, whether it was quizzes or Edpuzzle or um, Quizlet or whatever those those resources were. We modeled them together in class so that we didn't run into the kids to say, oh, well, I, I don't know how to do an Edpuzzle. Mm -hmm. We did one in class together, so you should know how to do it. That, um, that's super good advice, especially with, with everybody starting to think about planning for second semester. Absolutely. Well, right. last question. Um, it sounds like you've done a lot to help your kids get used to this transition. What have you what have you done to, to help grow yourself during this? What, what have you done to kind of scratch the, the how to become a better teacher itch? Well, I mean, for me, I feel like I'm a little bit of a dinosaur because the technology piece is not easy for me. So just getting in Canvas and and I have my Canvas buddy who is a student in my sandbox class so that I can practice things with her and vice versa. I practice, practice things for her. So that's been really good for me in terms of pushing myself to try to come up with more creative ways to impart instruction that meet them where they are in terms of their technology. Mm -hmm. um, because it's better than me. I, my technology. That, that's a great idea. So just to make sure you made a sandbox class and then you added one student in that class so they can they can yeah. kind of be your, your guinea pig. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, who's my teacher friend. And, you know, I'll, I'll text her or call her, or email her on a Wednesday mm -hmm. a lot of times and say, hey, I created a, a test or a quiz in my sandbox class. Please go take it yeah. and then tell me, you know, does it go away at this time? Does it mm -hmm. open at this time? Can you see it? You know, just to kind of see what it looks like on a student end and what it looks yeah. like on the teacher end for me, vice versa. So we do that, that for each other a lot. That makes a lot of sense because you can go into the student view, but it's not quite the same. Not everything is exactly like it looks like to a student. So okay. having, having, having somebody else that y'all can partner up like that, that's a great idea. You know, sometimes we want each student to get their own copy and type their own answers, but sometimes you want the students to collaborate. Yep. So at first, I mean, we've kind of figured a lot of those things out now, but at first trying to figure out how to do that in Canvas, which we were not used to, you know, it would be like she an assignment and then she'd say, OK, can you type on it? And I'd say yes. Or I'd say, no, I can't type mm -hmm. on it. So, you know, th things like that, which you think would be intuitive or not always intuitive when you're learning a new platform. Great. Great advice. Well, Andrea, thank you so much for uh, for coming on today. Um, some great advice for everybody and good luck for the rest of the year. Thanks, Chris Goodson. OK. All right. Bye bye. bye. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to find out more about the topics we discussed today, head over to our website at bit.ly forward slash great ideas. Don't forget to check out bit.ly forward slash Gaston Digital for the latest resources and professional development opportunities from your tech facilitators. In the coming weeks, we hope to cover a variety of topics. Have you used the discussions feature with your students in Canvas or Schoology? If so, let me know how it's worked out for you. You can find me on Twitter at, at Goodson. See you next time.